Okay, thanks. Welcome everybody to our Lunch and Learn today. Um, we are so honored to have the Clay siblings joining us, Gerald Brown and Michael Tavares, who are live from Pawtucket. Did I say it right? <laughs> Great. Um, and as always, I'm Jennifer Zwilling, the Curator of Artistic Programs. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us every week for being here today. Oh, I just saw Obi. Hey, Obi. And um, it is my moment of joy that I get to spend an hour every week with our community, um, hearing your voices, seeing your faces, just being inspired together by all the amazing people in our community who are making art and making a difference in the world. So thank you. We, as usual, um, want to remind you that we are offering this free programming to you and we would be grateful for your membership at the Clay Studio or perhaps a donation if you're interested. And as usual, one of my colleagues will put the link in the chat and then I am going to add the link for the Clay Siblings project because they also are an amazing organization who can use your support. Nope, that's not the right thing. Sorry, hold on one sec. Ah, too many screens are opening. There we go. All right. So, and you'll learn over the next hour about the amazing work they do, how hard they work, their mission, um, and about these two amazing people. So first I'd like to um, start with the land acknowledgement. The land where the clay studio stands and where I sit today is part of the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We acknowledge the Lenni Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of the Lenape in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief, Tamanend, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. So thanks to everybody. Okay, um, I'm gonna start out by um, letting Gerald and Mike say hi real quick, and then I'm gonna read you their formal bios. So I wanna hear their voices. Hey, cool. thank hi, you I'm guys. <sighs> No, I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here today. We're so excited to talk about stuff and um, just kind of share who we are and why we do what we do. Thank you for having us. Great. Thank you, guys. And they're not actually related. Don't let them trick you. It's in our we eyes. Try to do that. <laughs> it's in the eyes. The Clay Siblings Project is dedicated to transforming the landscape of ceramics, as well as challenging the status quo of who deserves to make. We are committed to changing the norm of which students get to have access to ceramics. We are committed to seeing the students continue to grow in whatever field they wish, even if it is not in the arts. But we want the students to know it is possible to pursue it as a career. By seeing an older sibling-like figure successful in college who may look like them, come from a similar background or family situation, we can validate and confirm that they can too. So that's the mission, um, at least part of it, that is listed on their website. And to get it, give everyone a chance to really just be present in what we're going to talk about this hour before we start off with individual um, Gerald and Mike as artists. So... Gerald is the social media curator for Ensika, a Claymobile teacher at the Clay Studio, where she has also been the retail and gallery assistant and curated the exhibition Funkadelic Awakenings. She was an amazing colleague and positive presence. It was a joy to, and honor to work with her. Gerald earned her BFA in ceramics and sculpture at Syracuse University. She researched in Paris as well as furthered her studies at Penland and Haystack Mountain School of Craft. In Philly, Gerald is a current member of the art collective Vox Populi, curating shows and special programming. She is on the board of directors at Watershed Center for Ceramic Art and co-founder of the Sibling Clay Siblings Project, which we'll learn more about. Mike Tavares grew up in Rhode Island, a child of parents both proudly from the Cape Verde Islands. Despite being raised in the US, Tavares' parents ensured that he understood their culture, spoke their language, and ate traditional Cape Verdean cuisine. 
Tavares received his BFA from Syracuse University, where he studied under Peter Biesiger and Errol Willard. During his studies, Tavares discovered his love for earthenware and wood-fired ceramics. He now has a home studio on Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and is the co-founder and co-leader of the Clay Siblings, which we will talk more about. All right, so I'm gonna start by asking each of you to tell us about what you remember about that first moment when you realized that you wanted to make a life in the creative arts. <laughs> um, I think like a, a very dreamy answer to that would be like, you know, I've always known when I was a kid because I would do different things like create little paper tape sets for my like toys or I would I love coloring having different kind of uh, executions of how I was gonna organize the page to uh, make manifest the, the proper coloring that I needed but um the the real answer the truthful answer is it, it really didn't happen until much later until um, you know on a good day I would say um, you know my senior year of college during my capstone thesis that I realized I, I could really be an artist. And, but on a doubtful day, it might've been just a year after um, I graduated from school. So to think that I spent, you know, maybe 22, almost 23 years of my life still questioning if I'm an artist um, is, is kind of an interesting way to think about that as a leader of an organization who is trying to encourage and tell kids that they can do it. You know, it's an ongoing uphill battle, but I think I never doubted my ability to contribute to this world and doubt my ability to do things that felt unique and artistic and creative to my own persona. But I think there's a, a disconnect between that understanding and then feeling like I can own this. This is my life. This is who I am. So I think that, um, you know, along the way with with the help of Mike and other friends and supporters, it's been kind of like a really um, amazing flower that's bloomed and me being able to take full advantage and walk in my truth now. That's a, a very profound way to say it, especially your last <clears throat> statement. Um, the idea that you, um, you know, that you would be going through your capstone and still be wondering about whether you were really an artist and in one way is like a, a pretty strong statement but I also think I know people who may you know be artists for their for 20 years after college and still be wondering if they're really artists so it might be an ongoing conversation in your mind but um the fact that you are so dedicated to giving kids the opportunity to even consider it um you know, maybe because of the fact that it was harder for you to get there. That's, I mean, it's, it's a really profound motivator to do that work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. How about you, Mike? When did you make that brave um, decision to become an artist? I think it, it's not something that, that is similar to Gerald that hasn't clicked per se. It's more of like a hallway that you're walking down. The farther you've gone down, you start to realize, okay, I think this is the path that I'm gonna continue going. Um, I've always was an artist. I mean, I always was making stuff, coloring, drawing. Mm. Um, you it wasn't until, to... yeah, I was coloring stuff <laughs> once in a while. I think I have a picture of myself painting a flower. <laughs> very small. But uh, yeah, uh, junior year in uh, high school is when I uh, would switch over to a dedicated visual performing arts school. And still there, I just kind of felt like I was just kind of doing this thing that I enjoyed doing. Um, it always was hard to imagine that as being my job or the thing that I was going to be doing. And then, you know, like I say, just keep going further and further and I end up in college and then I end up, you know, meeting Gerald and continue making and here we are now showing other kids that you can go down that hallway, that mysterious hallway that just, you know. So I'm still waiting for the day it sort of clicks. <laughs> you know, I'm an artist, that's what I'm doing. Well, I'm not an artist, but I can tell you as a curator or just a person, and someone who's 44, is that how old I am? Uh, I'm waiting for a click. I don't know, that's probably not true, but it, 
it it feels like it clicks in different ways at different times. I guess maybe that's what it is. Chuck, I love your cat. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> Chuck's, cat. Chuck's cat's always visit. She demands attention. <laughs> um, mine does that too. She sits right in, in front of the screen. Um, so talk a little bit maybe about how you guys came to see yourselves as clay siblings. Um, we didn't really talk about this on our, our test call, but um, when Gerald was working at the clay studio, she would talk about her brother. And I, it took me a while to realize that there's a, there's a blood brother and there's a clay brother. So do you wanna, I, I just love that you guys have that moniker for your relationship. Can you talk a little bit about that? You wanna shoot? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it was such a natural thing that sort of happened. It wasn't like we sat together and, and thought of names. Um, Gerald and I were sort of working around each other in the studio and um, I was sort of like this studio butterfly where I would just kind of land here and land there. And Gerald was working on these little cups. I remember to this day, she was putting faces on cups. Shout out to Peter. Right. And she was working in porcelain. I'm kind of like, why are you working in porcelain? Shout out and, to Peter again. Right. And so um, I go on to explain, you know, why, because it's a little more difficult, there's more crackage, you got to be more sensitive to the thickness and whatever and compression. And uh, anytime I was in the studio, she would just always pop in and ask questions and it started to become a back and forth as she started to uh, learn more about clay. And we had uh, grad students there that we looked up to. Uh, mine was Peter Smith was a grad student there and uh, Danielle Ruggiero was sort of Gerald's older sister and they act as mentors and friends and older brothers in a similar way. And then we sort of became closer and started considering ourselves like brother and sister. And so it was just such a natural process that took shape into what clay siblings is. Yeah, and a, a really huge conduit for all aspects of that relationship. So Danielle and Pete's as well as my relationship with Danielle and Mike's relationship with Pete and then the refer them Mike and I's relationship was all kind of through wood firing. Um, you know, Syracuse had a train as well as an Anagama. And for those who um, I'm familiar with wood firing. It's kind of like this very collaborative bonding experience. You uh, are with, a, usually you're with a team of people unless you're Mike Tavares trying to fire a kiln by itself. <laughs> um, but usually it's a team of people who come together. Um, you know, the main source for the kiln is, is powered by wood as well as like the glazing, you know, of the pots can, can be affected through the fire, the flame patterns, as well as like the melting of the wood ash. And it's a very, mentally and physically uh, strenuous process. Um, you know, like at the time when Mike and I decided to really start um, working on the project as well as just our own individual practices, we were in our junior year of spring, spring semester. And we're like in the midst of all this chaos, you know, we just did the project for the first time. Let's, let's just fire a wood kiln. We got, right. you know, not 10,000 so finals to do. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we really, not only the making process, we were connecting, but really that, that firing was a very pivotal moment. Um, learning about the kiln, learning about uh, when to let the coals burn to stoke some more, uh, add more wood to the kiln. And, you know, you're looking at about, you know, over two, <laughs> degrees of heat you know like that really can physically feel uh, stressful but then on top of that trying to find the rhythm with the person that you're working on the kiln with can also be just as stressful so you know in addition to like us loving you know stand-ups and music and just just food oh my gosh food um you know that firing or getting into wood firing was a huge part of us building our kind of bond as siblings because we really that tested like leaning on each other and really following each other's leads as well as uh trying to think about how can we achieve the goal we want without um letting whatever obstacles in front of us stop us and in the midst of the firing you know we were thinking we're gonna be finished sooner but <laughs> i had to go take a final oh, yeah. and so i'm leaving the kiln smelling like ham and all smoky, I hop on the bus, I get back to main campus, go take my final and then came back to the wood kiln. And meanwhile, Gerald has got her own thing. She's also got to work on. So, so then I leave and go do that. Right, so we kind of <laughs> lean on each other. And I guess that was, uh, that was the start of 
having each other's back. Yeah. Right. And then that kind of would firing, learning together, dealing with the stresses sounds a lot like the way you have to deal with um, running the clay siblings project once you get on the, like, well, for the whole year when you're planning and then on the ground and at Enseca. So we'll get to that in a sec, but I just want to back up. And I also see a really strong parallel to the clay studio. So you guys were, <clears throat> you know, became good friends through that very strong, I mean, really the, the college experience can be like a forge or a wood fire, you know, you're kind of thrown in there. Um, and then you realize that you wanna keep working together and you wanna maintain that relationship. And that's what happened with the five founders of the Clay Studio when they graduated, um, well, Ken being the professor in 1974. And they said like, all right, well, we wanna do something together. We wanna to make, um, make a space for ourselves. So. I just love that you're continuing that spirit of collaboration and just grassroots. All right, we see this thing that we want to make happen and we're gonna do it. Um, and you do it through the strength of that relationship that you built, which is so important. You're kind of mentoring each other as peers. And then you found these like big siblings. And then you also found um, Peter Biesecker, who was your professor. And I know you wanted to be able to talk about the importance of his mentorship. Um, so do you wanna talk yeah. more about Peter? Um, I think that Mike and I are already pretty energizing and tangential and kind of all over the place when it comes to how we move, but also how we think. But um, our advisor, Peter, has um, always tried to nourish that aspect of us. And I think at the beginning of the project, we were a little bit more closed-minded to what we could do, what the project's possibility was, and he was so instrumental in kind of allowing us to think beyond what is right in front of us, beyond what we think we're capable of, beyond what uh, we have the financial resources to do. You know, I think that um, sometimes we really uh, would be like, oh, we could approach it like this. And then Peter's like, well, why don't you just do this? And then we're like, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that that's such a very critical part to how we started moving forward with the project. And um, you want to you wanna touch on the 10K idea? Yeah, um, very early on, he introduced this idea of what would you do with $10,000. And so, you know, you have to know how to spend five grand before you know how to spend 10 grand. You got to know how to spend two grand before you can spend five grand. And so it was just sort of this slow build and how would we develop that in as the project has evolved and as we start to implement new and better ideas, we figure, you know, we need a little bit more money to do that. And so it's been a slow, uh, gradual build. Um, I don't think we've answered the $10,000 question yet. It's still growing, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're always lo looking back at like, okay, but wouldn't it be cool if we did this? And right. then that, that gives us more ammunition to try to attack that question again. But um, I don't know, I feel like without, like Peter's been a great mentor just in general to us. Um, like he was both our first throwing professors. Um, but I think overall just having him help us train our minds to think beyond what's in front of us, I think is what we're trying to instill with like the students that we work with, right? Or we're trying to instill in like the community members that we partner with. Um, what can we really do if we if we all pulled ourselves together? Like what could we accomplish? And I think that's sometimes probably on the on a really good day, 80% of the problem is that we're not really thinking hard enough or critically enough or imaginative enough to see what's what's possible. And then from there it's just like the how-tos. And the how-tos is kind of interesting because uh, in the beginning, it's sort of be like, yeah, but Peter, how would we, how would we get this done? <laughs> Peter, how do we get money for that? And he goes, just don't worry about it. And then we'll get like an email that very much answers our question for us. Uh, mm -hmm. And over time, he, slow, he slowly takes, you know, steps back and sort of allows us to answer those questions on our own as we gain more experience and we get to know more people in the field and, you know, have access to these things. Yeah. Yeah, you needed... Um... Well, it, it's just empowering to have a person you look up to give you the permission to believe in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, why don't you walk us through sort of, how did you come up with the idea of Clay Siblings? And for people, you know, I read that little thing, but I don't know that everybody on the call knows the exact sort of procedure of what happened. So the um, Clay Siblings just really briefly gather artists and, and in the city where Nsika happens, we'll go in and <clears throat> work with high school students and then bring them back to the conference so that they can see that there are, you know, 6,000 people have gathered to talk about pottery so that it's a, a real thing. So why don't you guys talk about that moment of like, well, wait a minute, what can we, like, how can we, um, you know, use this as a jumping off point? My memory is not so great. <laughs> so I don't remember the exact moment or how it sort of went down. Um, I know that Gerald approached me with the idea and I thought it was a really great idea and a really great opportunity. And so the first Clay Siblings visit was in Portland and it was just the two of us. And we went to two different schools. Mm -hmm. One public, one private school. One public and one private school. And it, it felt natural. It was, it was just like sort of us being in the studio together where we're making, 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 turning, talking about something related or unrelated to Clay and then making, making, making. Um, and students got to get involved. And so it felt like you sort of had a class of little brothers and sisters. Yeah. Um, yes. Somewhere um, in the middle, like I was having a conversation with Peter and Peter was like, wouldn't it be cool? Like, like all these resources go to uh, the conference city. There's all these people, all this clay, all these resources, exhibitions. And the, the community, I was like, does the community really know what's happening? And he started to explain some, some of the semantics to that. And from there, with, with the help of Peter and then Mike and I coming together, we were like, well, we could like do workshops with the high school students and then they would know that these things are happening at the same time and they would be able to take advantage of them. And so when we first did the project in Portland, we're like, do, we had like a whole like PowerPoint and like showing them like, oh, this is us at school. This is us here. We do this, da, 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 da. Um, and then at the, the last slide, we always included like, you know, um, a picture of us like at the conference with, with some of our favorite artists and then like the logo and Sika. And we're like, so yeah, which brings us to like, this conference is here and you should do this. And it was like, some of the kids didn't believe us or some of the kids like didn't understand what we were, what we were offering or the impact of it. And some kids were just like, yeah, right. A bunch of people come here for clay. <laughs> so um, the following year we were able to, um, kind of work with Nsika to provide day passes to bring six students from the high school we were working with in Pittsburgh to the conference. So we would have the two day workshops, um, which we recruited like BFA students to help lead with us. And then we brought those six kids to the conference. And so, you know, they're all excited about the resource hall. They're like, oh my gosh, that's a kiln. <laughs> and then, right. like, there's like people and exhibitions and that's a giant pot, you know? And so it really starts to bring to life some of those things that we were saying and demonstrating in front of them. It, it became much more realistic and they could see themselves in the environment, which is like the most important part is like, you know, if you take the first part of, away the workshops and just bring them to a place they have no context they don't really see how the, the skills or the resources are tangible and then you know if you do the reverse where you only give them a workshop then they only see like oh well this is just like a little tiny activity that i could just do at school or at home so it's really important to bring the two together so then not only do they can continue growing the skill sets but they can continue to grow and see themselves in the field as like either taking on a profession um, as a maker, or they can learn about art history, or there's just so many other avenues if they want, you know, it's not uh, mandatory, just making sure they um, have the opportunity to see what's out there. I, yeah, I've often, like at the Clay Studio, we've often talked about the fact that we're going, you know, when we're in Philly, we're, we're ha we have a very strong mission to reach out to the community um, and let them know about Clay and 
offer free programming to people who wouldn't otherwise, you know, even think to go, well, like, what's the place you do? Why would we take a class there? And how could we do that when we go to Inseca? But there's so much other stuff going on and, you know, pulls on the attention and the fact that you guys figured it out. I'm super impressed. And as soon as you started doing it, I feel like because it was, I think a thing that people had in the back of their head that they were like, how do we fix that? I just know like word of mouth about the program got went really quickly and you got a lot of positive, I don't know, from what I heard anyway, everyone was like super impressed as I am. Um, so you also sort of gloss over this, like, well, we just went to two schools. I mean, that's just, just finding two schools is a lot of work and figuring out when you can, I mean, I've dealt with public schools. How do you figure out what day you can show up? And do you have to have your your clearances? And, you know, um, if they don't have pottery wheels and you want to show them how to throw in the wheel, like, how do you do all this? So can you talk a little bit about the incredible amount of work you do to <laughs> organize it? So in my opinion, I think contacting schools is the biggest mountain to climb every <laughs> year. Um, so first of all, it's just getting in contact with a teacher. Obviously, you're calling during uh, during school, and so these teachers are in their classes. And if you're lucky, you catch them on their break or in between classes. And um, we always get, like, the person who works in the front office, and she's like, oh, well, I'll connect you. And we get connected. We leave a voicemail. And we continue to call and call. If we, if we get to the point where we get in contact with teachers, then they're sort of, they're already saying no by coming up with excuses. like oh, well, um, we don't really have the money to do something like this. And it's like, no, it's, co it's a completely free process. And go, okay, well, we don't have that much clay or wheels. We'll go, we're going to bring all that stuff in. Plus, we're going to be bringing other BFA candidates to do it as well. So then they're kind of backed into a corner. And <laughs> their last excuse is like, well, it's kind of a busy semester or something. Then we can't do anything about that. But once you get to that point, then sometimes you hear like a little the pitch go up and there was like, okay I, I guess i could i guess i could do that i guess we can we what? can figure something out right right but the entire process of just getting these teachers attention and you know uh driving the project home to them is difficult and i don't blame them because when you go to these high schools and you work i mean we go in in the morning and we stick through through all the periods and sometimes we even have a skip like a, a period where no classes are in there so we'll have a little break and, or um, kids stay around <laughs> When we get home, we immediately go to bed and then we'll wake up and then we'll eat and then we'll go right back to bed and do the same thing the next day on the second day. Yeah, and I I think it's it's a really beautiful process to, you know, navigate every year because each year when we think we figured it out or found a way to attack a situation um, and have a little bit more success, we run into something else that's like, oh, we didn't consider that. And I think you know, that can be a very deterring feeling because, you know, we're just like, how can we get through and, and show that we're true, that this is a real project, that we've been doing this, this and this and this. Um, but sometimes we, we have to lean on other, um, you know, artists in the community, other resources, other people. Um, you know, sometimes we, we even like get a chance to reach, uh, work with different, um, community centers or boys and girls clubs. So, you know, it's, it's about what can we do to support this community and give them a, a open door to have access to this space and access to these resources and people. But um, it, it definitely can be daunting, but we're very thankful, um, you know, with the expansion of the project, we've been able to recruit different BFA students. So a lot of the front work or the, the front aspect of the project is it's about supporting high school students. But the second half is really about supporting other BFA candidates, um, supporting other BFA candidates who don't, don't have the experience at that moment to learn how to teach. You know, and sometimes when you leave school, you're like expected to have all this experience, but then like you can't get the experience unless you have the experience. And so it's just like this, this paradox. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to allow people um, the eight, like, you know, at a young age to be able to learn how to teach, how to communicate, translate some of these integral skills, um, and also just have fun, you know, and give back. I think that uh, that's probably one of my secret favorite parts about it is like seeing, um, you know, we, we all meet up on uh, the Sunday before the Monday and Tuesday workshops and we, we get an Airbnb 
and we will, like all the siblings stay together and so it's kind of like orientation we get them caught up on the ropes all of that we we try to make them feel comfortable and all those different things and they always have like all these questions all these kind of concerns and a little bit of fear and they're like well you didn't explain this i don't know this and this and it's like you know part of it is like yes we're like you know 24 at the time and we can't, we can't really uh we're working on our communication skills but also it's like there's some things we just cannot explain like you just your professors, uh, we, we typically reach out to a professor or Peter helps us connect with a professor and they recommend two students who they think will be really great fits for the project. So part of them have been recommended on the strength that the professor knows that they're capable of doing this thing. So we, we try to encourage that and remind them like, you've been selected right. and, and you've been shown that you can do this, you know, and really give them that that energy. And then the second day after the, you know, the Monday workshops, they're like, you're like, okay, I understand. They still have, you know, tons more questions, but now they have tons more like answers that they've seen in, in the process. And so they go in on the last day with full energy. You know, usually the second day is more of the decorating phase, getting things um, ready to, to be fired. Um, but usually it's, it's always a really cool up and down, um, similar to the teachers of like, I don't know what to expect. I don't know how to do this, but right, you know, right. the, the happens in the moment. <laughs> yep, rolling, rolling with it. And I think also that's kind of not to go back to the wood fire metaphor, but Mike and I used to also say when you like stoke the kiln, it's like you're boxing, right. like shadow boxing, like, uh, uh, trying to dodge the flame. You know, a little bit about that is just like how clay civils is, you know, from the teachers, from the, the BFA candidates. Um, you just kind of got to roll with it. And most of the time you don't, you don't get beat up too bad. <laughs> well, so threaded into what you're saying is a lot more of this like really hard work, which is, so you've taken clay and wheels from one of the local universities, right? Is that where you get them from? No, we actually have clay donated. Um, and typically we find a community center that is willing to um, loan us the wheels. Um, the, the BFA candidates do bring stuff. Sometimes their clay clubs uh, donate, you know, resources and things like that. But also um, students have gone back. Um, I think you, you talk about um, who's from, from Was it the home? Minneapolis. Yeah, they brought, what did they bring? So when, when we recruit the BFA candidates, we're looking at colleges and universities that sort of surround the region that we're gonna be going to so that it's more likely that they're, they'll be able to go back because Oh, to go to the same school again. Right, yeah. right. If it's possible for them. Um, yeah, that's and sweet. because of that, we, yeah. sometimes we have students go back and like, for example, someone, I can't remember their name now, but someone had brought up plaster bats to help reclaim clay. Um, I remember Nick Mudd left a ton of clay. Yeah, 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 yeah. At, uh, I think it was at a community center. Yeah. Um, Just for the kids to play with. like. Right. Yeah, one of this, I remember right now, they they literally left in between the first workshop and the second workshop and made the plaster slabs and brought them back. Oh, because the they realized they were needed. Wow. Yeah, so I, I like, it's, it's sometimes all the, the years merge together. Right. But um, that was like so incredibly unbelievable because here we have like a student who's just charged with like, I see that they don't have this. And if they don't get this, then these are the other obstacles they're going to have. And I feel like, that's what we're always trying to encourage or, or inspire or create a spark for because, you know, there are so many other things that are going to stop these students, these teachers from, you know, moving forward down the process, moving forward down this hallway. And if too many obstacles build up or the obstacle is too big, that could just shut down movement, shut down momentum. And so what we want to do is try to encourage little things like that to help keep the ball continuously rolling um, and provide more opportunities. Yeah, we get um, really obsessed with detail at times. And so we're trying to consider everything around this globe and how do we make sure that we take advantage of every opportunity, for example, recruiting people that would be around that region so that they can go back. And we've seen that that's worked in the past, but also, you know, keeping a fire lit with the teacher as well. You know, there's times where, where Mr. Peterson, I sat there and I just explained everything to him. Like, this is how you reclaim clay. Don't be afraid of this or... If you're, you know, I uh, wrote down a couple different uh, kiln programs so that if he needs to do a slow bisque, a fast bisque, explain to him, you know, what they're doing at different temperatures and stuff, just so that he can continue to keep the ball rolling. Um, so, so are you finding places that have kilns? Or was it that you were taking the work and firing it and bringing it back? Like, 
<laughs> so some schools Both. do have kilns and some schools <laughs> don't have kilns. And so um, we're not at the point yet where we're bringing kilns to school. Yeah. <laughs> no, but do you, were you taking the work off to like wherever you borrowed the wheels from and getting it fired and then it would get dropped off later? Or how so, did that so in Richmond, that was our, we had set up uh, a kind of structure that we, that would be the first year we've ever worked with schools that had no kilns. Um, in the past, we've worked with schools that had no clay but they had kilns um places that had no wheels but this like we've been able to do all of them but they've had kilns which is kind of right. funny well like my son's school has a kiln but nobody knows how to use it so. right so that's what we've like tried to help do and nourish um but that was our our goal um when we started working on you know pushing the bar of like okay who can who are we inadvertently leaving out right okay we're leaving out schools that don't have any of these users period right, right? Yeah. Um, a small goal that we have, well, not a small, a very great goal that we have is um, getting recruitment for um, non-university siblings. So like universities have been like a departure point to help um, get young people who are in clay to help teach these workshops. But what we ultimately want to do is be able to show these high school students that whether you go to school or not, there are people out there doing it. And there are people out there are like who are not much older than you and I think that will really open up and make uh anything possible because I think that um if we only are able to limit it to showing them university schools that will only reinforce the idea that you have to go to college to have access to this right. that was kind of the point of bringing the BFA campus we wanted to show a spectrum of skill sets but also backgrounds mm -hmm. and so who are we to just leave out everyone who's not in a university yeah um I think talking about the power of, of showing the, you know, all the different people who are involved is, is actually um, when you get them to Wenzika. And yesterday you told me about Malik. Do you want to tell everybody about um, your experience with that student? So um, there's always a fun moment when you go to these high schools and everyone is a little bit standoffish. Everyone's just <laughs> kind of like, no, I'm too cool for school, et cetera. But you always get those, just all you need is really like three or two adventurous student to come up and make a bowl and then the other students see them make a bowl and now everyone wants to get involved and Malik was sort of that tool cool to be a school kid um he had really nice clean sneakers on and nice clothes his hair was dyed he's a good looking kid and um <laughs> he finally approaches the wheel and he gets on it and I'm showing him how to throw I'm showing him the ropes and so he's throwing a couple bowls and then you know we're constantly having students cycle through in and out and they had several wheels. And so I'm at the wheel that I was at teaching this one girl how to throw. And I looked to my left and there's Malik teaching another girl how to throw. And it was like a moment of just like, this kid just started throwing and he's already, he's got it grasped just enough where he's teaching someone else how to throw. And then he takes it a step further. <laughs> so we got to take that entire school uh, to Inseca. It was part of a field trip and we got to be part of that. And part of that field trip, they had sort of a scavenger hunt. So there's high school students all over this place. And I was just sort of bouncing around and sort of directing students like, oh, you should check this out, or you should go look at that. You should go speak to this person. And I see this sort of crowd. And in this crowd, I see his dyed hair. And I go up to him I'm like, what are you looking at? And he goes, no, I'm just waiting. I'm like, what are you waiting for? And he goes, I signed up to be in a throwing competition. I'm just waiting for him to call my name so I can go up and throw in front of all these people. And it was like this amazing moment where last week this kid had no clue he could make a bowl with his hands. And today he's at a conference with thousands of people who have been throwing for X amount of years. And he's willing to step up to the plate and throw um, sitting next to a guy who probably has years of experiences versus his maybe two hours of throwing. <laughs> so uh, it was just like a really great moment. And it's, it's those moments that are the most rewarding because it's kind of the point of the project. Um, Gerald can speak to hers, but you know, come, coming from a place where you don't have those options, you don't see those things. And when you don't see them, you don't get to have the option to say yes or no. And I sort of saw that in Malik where we presented him with the option to say yes or no. And it was an amazing yes. And um, he showed that in, in ways that we didn't have to ask, you know, he's teaching someone how to throw, he's going into throwing competitions, he's asking about continuing to be making and um, It's just really exciting to see that I was able to provide that for someone else uh, when I was lucky enough to have that for myself at some point. I just, I just love that story. And yeah, it's so, it's so powerful to, um, 
to go from having someone who's like, I'm not going to do that to when you t teach somebody else how to do something. I mean, you, you just say you really get ownership of it. And so that happened with, because of what you guys did for this kid in such a short period of time. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone knows that if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat in about five more minutes. Well, you can um, take yourself off mute and um, ask them yourself, but for now we'll just keep things in the chat. Um, when we were talking yesterday, Gerald said um, she wants to give more people more options to make the world better. That's what craft means. And I just, I said I was going to write it down. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> it's poet. So good. No. <laughs> um, yeah. You got that goal. Yeah, I think that, you know, like the project ultimately wants to make sure that everybody has access, right? And so, you know, the, the natural inclination is if everybody has access, then there's going to be tens of thousands more artists, right? But in reality, it just, it doesn't necessarily insinuate that, you know, it just allows more people to feel connected to the material, feel connected to this process in a way that creates empathy and understanding for what art and, and craft and culture does, you know? And I think that, you know, when more people have access to this, even though it might not immediately translate to this number of artists being in the world, but what it will do is translate to um, more people being able to do for each other, more people to be able to impact the world in a more um, positive, but also like um, empathetic way. Because I think that one, another thing Peter, <laughs> you can see a trend of Peter telling us cool stuff, but um, Peter would say is just like, you know, you need people out there to like pottery. So then the person who's the potter can survive, right? And so, you know, when you have more people out there who are in touch and love clay, then it helps the people who do want to choose that field, like have less restrictions, less boundaries, less problems. And that can only create uh, more beauty in the world, more, more life, more success. And I think that to me, that's, that's the ultimate goal, you know, and I think I love being able to tell students that like, yeah, there was a day, there was many days that I didn't think I was going to be an artist. And it's okay that, you know, you are still figuring that out, but here's like some clay to play with, you know, here's like, I'm gonna teach you how to pinch, do a pinch part. Like, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. I'm gonna teach you how to make a plate. I'm gonna teach you how to do whatever. And even if like, you know, they never touch clay again, they have that experience. Right. And when they see something in the world, they're like, oh, I remember when I did that. Right. Or like, if their kid like and Anita can talk about this like how you know having generations of people that she's taught right and like like a kid being able to come to a class and see and, and then like tell their mom and it's just like oh I took a class here or I know this you know and so that generational knowledge really is uh, infiltrates the families it, it breaks down barriers it breaks down um, cultural kind of um disadvantages is sometimes people are navigating. And I think overall, like, isn't that what we want, you know, or isn't that what we expect of lawyers, right? Or we expect of doctors of all these other fields. It's like very, very synonymous with our field. Mic drops. Yeah. <laughs> no, drops, mic. mic. <laughs> Wait, I took, I took me out. I, took um, me out. <laughs> I think that that, it's so nicely kind of connects back to that original metaphor of the wood fire being what kind of formed and forged your relationship and, and these ideas um, in the same way that word empathy that you used is something that I think is so important. It's like the most important part of being a successful human. Um, and there's a physical empathy with clay because you can shape it. And so it's that it's a metaphor again for being able to, to manipulate um, this material and make something the way you want it to be. And that's the same thing that you guys are doing through this project and that art does when it is put out into the world. You're putting your emotions and your cultural identity out into the world so that somebody else can understand it and have empathy. And then that only gets amplified. So I wanna thank you both for what you do.
not to say that we don't have a few more minutes to talk, but I think it's really important to just acknowledge the gratitude for, for being dedicated to this pursuit. Um, okay, I'm going to read some comments in the chat and then I want anyone else to um, add their comments or you can feel free to take yourself off mute. Um, Raymond says, that's the beauty of clay. It has always been collaborative, a communal thing. It brings people together. Kay Gehring said, I must say that finding those artists who advise and encourage are a key aspect of my experience at the clay studio from when I took classes to being an associate. Michelle says, as a retired English teacher, I couldn't wait to become a maker of clay pots. I knew about Enseca from my son who attends as a maker and a teacher. My first experience was better than a kid going to Disney World. <laughs> to make that opportunity <laughs> available to high school students is an overwhelming achievement. Thank you for sharing your love of clay with the next generation. Raymond says, the idea that you two siblings are connecting, connecting workshops with the larger field of clay is so valuable, thanks. Clay Studios new building, <laughs> I knew Raymond would get that in there somehow, is planning to have a kind of studio on the first floor right near the gallery and shop where visitors can make things and begin to make those kinds of connections. Yeah, the community studio is going to have free programming um, and it's going to be really exciting. And Kevin Snipes is here and he said crafting Clay Studio, no, Clay Siblings probably is what he means, is a profound artist project. Your artist materials include molding community. Even though there are so many, wait, moved, hold on, logistics, you feel like the artist through this project, like your the project itself is your art. And then Kate says, has Clay Siblings ever worked with community art centers? We're continually struggling to connect this material with everyone. It is hard to reach out to schools, especially now. I guess there was a, a question in that last one. The other one was just all the wonderful praise. I think Kevin was asking a question too. Like, oh, was, he, was it a question? It says, even though there are so many logistics, you feel like the artist through this project? Oh, do you feel like the artist? Yeah. Okay. Um, That's a good question. I think um, <laughs> if the company that builds the house feels like artists, then sure. Like. If we're building, if you're building the frame, putting electricity together, you like the actual that. engineers, right, right. Mm. I never thought of it that way, though. I think, I don't, Kevin. Please type in there if you if you have more clarity to provide. But um, you take yourself off mute too. Just talk if you want. I think that for me, there's if I can be very honest, there's there has been a struggle with me thinking I'm an artist while running this nonprofit project, you know, cause sometimes there's more community building layers or responsibilities than actual art making or artistic uh, nature. And even though there's an art to all of what we do, what we're considering and sometimes like that, my actual physical making sometimes have felt like do people know that I actually make my own work, <laughs> you know, and um, that sometimes I make stuff that's not clay related. You know, I do love making these pinch fruits, but I, I make diagrams too. And I make audio files and zines. Um, and so sometimes because of the magnitude and the tremendous beauty of clay siblings, I can feel more of like a project manager in the project right. than an actual uh, artist sometimes because of just like the phone calls and the sometimes the nitty, nitty gritty stuff of that, but I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I mean, I, I love what I do and I, I don't take it personal. I just say like, I love making my own work. And if you want to dive into that, we can talk about that. But if you want to talk about clay cylinders, like let's talk about clay cylinders because that's very important to me um, in, in every deal of what it is. Yeah, similar to what Gerald's saying, the clay cylinders is more like we're bouncing off each other, making decisions, and you know, we're also reaching out to other people who are helping us, um, dealing with other teachers and students, etc. And with art, you know, there there is no sort of limit. You know, if I'm making something, I can go. I want to go this way, and then I just go that way while I'm listening to Kendrick Lamar. Like it's just so, it's up to me. You know, everything is up to it's me. It's very you personal. Know. It's very it's right, almost right. selfish in some some regards. It is, and especially as I've been practicing more, making pods that don't function as well but sort of 
will catch your eye in a different way. And so when I'm making those pots that don't function so well, I'm okay with someone saying, this doesn't work as good, or this isn't as comfortable, but with the project, we have to make sure that it's, you know, that we're considering all those things and mm -hmm. people are safe and, and uh, comfortable. But then I would push back, Kevin, this is a great question. Uh, I would push back though, that sometimes we can be even very stubborn and very selfish about things with the project. Um, where sometimes it would be like, oh, we, we should be accommodating of, of these other things and how other people see us and what people feel. Like, sometimes we like put our foot down, <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's really important for us to be like, no, this has to look exactly like this. This has to do this. This has to function like this. Like, because it's so important to us about everything being extremely considered and everything, not necessarily being picture perfect, but it's like, it's like when you look at a bowl, you know, like you're considering the foot ring and how it connects to the table. You're considering the lip and how it touches somebody's mouth. You're considering how much food they can hold, how much food they can't hold. Like you're considering every aspect of the object. And I feel like we just, it's, it's so necessary and adamant about this project when we have to like do certain things like that. So then I will push back and say, yes, Kevin, I do feel like the artist sometimes. So I don't know. It's like, it's like a whole bunch of different um, no, hey, you guys. This is Kevin talking. Oh, there's Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hi. Good to <laughs> you hear you. You guys are beautiful. <laughs> hey, so, so I would propose that you guys are, are artists within your project. I mean, think about someone like Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. You know, he made his factory and then he brought all these people together. Mm -hmm. And that was, mm -hmm. you know, one of his art forms. You know, so it doesn't matter, like, to be an artist, you don't have to actually, um, you know, like, sit there and make something. You could be someone like uh, Ai Weiwei, mm -hmm. where you're in prison mm -hmm. and you say to your, uh, your workers, can you make this for me? And, and then it's, it's your project because you were like and pro propelling, you're kind of uh, instigating the act and you're starting something and it's kind of blooming into something else. So, mm -hmm. so I would suggest you guys embrace it as an art project, you know, take that control and take that, take that beauty of making something that's that that's your own you're you know it's it's amazing what you're doing well, yeah so that, you know so, so you are artist character. in this project <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you I, I feel like this this springs board or, or reminds me um of like that that question that the answer was proposing to everybody in in milwaukee like do you do you want to make the thing or do you want to make the thing that makes the thing you know and i feel like um either way it goes you're the artist in both in both options. Yeah, you can do both, and sometimes okay. you do one, more one more than the other. Thank you know, you. so clay siblings might take a lot of logistics. You know, so you got to really dig into it. But that doesn't mean you you're not not artist because okay. you're using your artist sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And it's that same yeah. idea I think of like comparing when people have a sculptural yeah. practice and a functional practice. There's actually the problem solving that you need to do in one informs the fact that you don't need to do it in the other. Like it makes you more aware that you have freedom mm -hmm. there and then it makes you appreciate the parameters in, in the first thing. Um, Leo has her hand up. Leo, do you wanna ask a question? I guess I was more trying to build up on that question that Kevin asked um, in the sense that I don't, I think sometimes depending on like I can see something like a project of, uh, of course, like the clay siblings having to deal with like all of the logistics and all of that, how sometimes that might take away from your quote unquote artistic practice. And I only say that quote unquote, because I don't think those two things are separated. You know, I think it's just like what the, but I don't think one can exist without the other. Yeah, right. So, yeah. I yeah, mean, if we, we have our brains, like, it's not like I'm going to say, okay, Joe, take that part of your brain out. Right, and then right totally. Do this. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it is because of what you know of the material. It is because mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. your experiences, right? Um, and those that taught you, that inspire you to do that. So again, like, for me, seeing it that way, it's like one thing cannot exist without the other. Although I completely relate to the idea of sometimes kind of feeling or thinking that if you would like so much time with something that it's not necessarily what you might see as like your own practice, um, 
maybe make having that make you feel less of an artist. And I think it just becomes part of like the, a bigger question, but also reframing what we think being an artist is. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, just living in your own in your studio making work without any context is not I don't think it's what either of you wants to do anyway, but it's not really um, you, you need all these other kinds of activities to inform that. Um, Michelle has your hand up. Thanks, Leo. So um, just on that note, I also think of Holly Hanishan's work where she's doing socially engaging mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, it's really it's just making those connections. Um, but I also wanted to say, I was writing my goals uh, for a grad school class um, just yesterday on like one year out and three years out of grad school. And um, so this is actually some of the things that I wanted to do. So I'm so glad I sat in this because uh, Gerald, we're gonna have to talk. <laughs> I know, it's been um, online for a minute. I'm so sorry it's taken me so long. <laughs> I know, um, but I'm interested, do you go to places? So are you invited? Like if I, I'm in Texas and I wanted to invite Clay siblings out here, I mean, how does this work? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm gonna propose something. I'm gonna look to Mike. <laughs> we answer this question, and then somebody else also in there was asking us about virtual workshops and things. So we should can we tackle both together? Okay. Yeah, right. and we haven't talked about what you're doing at Encika this year. So cool. Right. And right. we're we're five minutes over. So if anyone needs to go, oh, we understand. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm I can stay. Not a problem. But I know some people might have. Yeah, to leave. and I think Jen said that it will be. So if we stay a little bit longer, and you want to hear the answer, but you got to go. Just um, check back into the, the recorded video. Um, so to answer so that question, we use like from September up until leading around when Antigua happens, we use about that much time to organize um, our workshops for these schools. We've always been open to the idea of being invited places, although we haven't had the opportunity to take on something like that. We've had had people reached out in the past, but it sort of, um, sort of withered away, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, you know, Jill and I also work, we live in two different cities. We have uh, jobs that are sort of constant income. Um, we are also artists that work in the studio. And so we're always trying to find time to sort of balance that out. And um, well, I think we're, we're very open to going to different yeah. places. And, you know, if we can find a space and time to do so, we can. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with mm -hmm. someone about potentially doing something uh, in the city of Providence in Rhode Island. And so, you know, we're always open to those conversations and trying to figure out how we can uh, make something happen. Yeah, and multiple types of people have reached out. So like the Providence one, it was actually like, like a, a college academic institution that reached out to us. And so um, we, we're open to different things. I feel like one thing that we told Jen yesterday was just like, we're always trying to uh, balance how much we take on because for one, we're just, it's literally just Mike and I and, and Peter. <laughs> so it's more like two and a half people, <laughs> you know, like we really are um, still, you know, practicing artists still have jobs and things like that. But, you know, we, we try to always ask the question, what aren't we doing? How can we do more? What, what can we change up this year? How can we experiment? And so, you know, other institutions, you know, whether they be high schools or community centers, or um, you know, universities uh, trying to think through how can we, um, you know, collaborate or bring that together. And another unspoken kind of rule that we um, kind of want to implement if we work with a, another high school is like, if a school is willing to pay for us to, you know, fly out and then come to, you know, their high school to work with their students and stuff like that, that we would write up in the agreement that we would be able to work with a school that wouldn't be able to have access to bring us out there. So that way we're, um, it's not just like the person with the biggest wallet wins us, it's more about like feasibility, but also like if you're willing to bring us out, then that means you are supporting other people in this area who wouldn't be able to like at like requ like bring that to us you know and i think that that's kind of like just a, a unspoken thread that we want to do um we're moving forward with other other engagements as well as virtual engagements which brings me to the second part of somebody's question so this year we are going to be doing um the workshops uh we're going to be doing them in april 
versus March when Sika takes place, because if we're not tied to a location and a time physically, then why um, hold that restraint against ourselves? So we're going to be doing uh, clay kits where we have ball of clay, tools, and then um, a special other item that is specific to the theme, and then um, a pot in there. And so we have been reaching out to artists about donating um, pots to us. And um, we're going to have a date where we go down to each city and then we package all that stuff neatly into a box and then deliver it to the schools where the kids will pick it up individually and then we'll have our virtual workshops through uh, Zoom or Google. Yeah, so the, the cool benefit about this interesting problem that we're tackling is that now we can be incredibly intentional about each aspect of a project. And so, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it's like it's about the workshops and like them learning a skill. Um, it's about them being able to see themselves in the field of art, but then also have some kind of connector piece that sees that clay is more than just some meaningless material, you know, really being able to see that it, it has some, uh, some potential and some existence that's related to the outside world. And for us, that's like one of the most important things about um, the, taking away from these workshops is now we can distill what a workshop is and like rather than lean on easy conventions that we normally use, we can now create different almost methodologies or like plans of actions like, okay, if we want to, if it's important to tackle these three things, then like, okay, how, what is the best way to do it? Who can we involve? How can we bring that to somebody? What is this going to look like? What's the long-term plan? What's the short-term plan? So it helps actually, it's as sad as the coronavirus is, it has actually helped us expand the project and help us um, serve more people and actually how to open up in a way that is going to allow us to do more programming in the future that's beyond what people normally see us operating in. That's exciting. I mean, we found that too at the Clay Studio that well, do like this lunch and learn. <clears throat> We've got mm -hmm. people from all over the world, I think. Um, like my friend Eva from UK is here. <laughs> I was looking, I was like, hey, Eva. <laughs> and you guys have a talk with her next week? Uh, yeah, well, I just, um, me, I'm gonna be talking with Ayumi Ori. Um, so I, small, tiny plug, please uh, join us. It will be also at noon on the second, um, a conversation with Shipley Art Gallery at Newcastle University. Is it Ava or Eva? I know, I feel like I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> no, you got it right, Eva. Eva, yes. So Eva will be moderating it, uh, a conversation with Ayumi and I about um, digital platforms, curating spaces, community building, and how we're using activism to try to create more equity within the community, both UK as well as like US based. And I know Eva had a really amazing sounding program on Tuesday that I couldn't make it to, but I'm hoping that one was recorded. Yeah, it will be. It's gonna, they're all gonna be um, made available. I mean, it's a while, they'll take a while to kind of process it, but it'll be sort of around March, I think. Oh, sorry, am I really far away? It'll be around March. <laughs> they kind of become available. <laughs> I also want to note that um, I think it might have been autocorrect, but in Gerald's uh, email, it said Eva Mastermind. Oh, that's not really her name. Oh, I really. Yeah. I thought it was like, yeah, she is the mastermind. That is right. It, you know, oh. the mind. <laughs> I told Mike today, I was like, yeah, and she has a cool ass name, Mastermind. I totally thought that. I soaked that up to all Oh, I just figured it was. <laughs> okay. My bad. Thank you draw attention to that. It just, it was, it was uh, accurate. Um, all right, well, although there are more questions and comments, we have gone over, so I'm going to put the um, questions and comments in um, an email to, to Gerald and Mike so they can look at them later. And anyone who wants to check out the recording, it should be up probably next week. We are so grateful to you both for your time and all the work that you do and your amazing spirits. And yeah, I'm, in, I'm energized by you. So thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for joining. Lovely to see you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing your story and all your all your work. Wonderful. Thank you, Chuck. So good to see you, man. And your cat. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Gonna wave you out. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Hi, Gerald. <laughs> your haircut looks good. Hey, Thank Josie. you. Yeah. It's good to see you. I miss so you.
I know we live like relatively <laughs> around the corner. <laughs> like two blocks from each other. You know, King's been closed. That's why we haven't been able yeah, to see each other. Yeah, I know. I'm waiting for him to open. Kings. I was, if we had more time, we could have talked about food. I, I love King's Water Ice. If oh, people one. in the Philly area, please go check them out. Strawberry Mansion, the pretzel with pizza. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite. I don't oh, know about that. A little water ice. <laughs> it's like right around the corner from where Gerald and I live. I mean, I've seen it. I didn't know they had pizza sauce on a pretzel. Yeah, it's, it's so good. And then if you really want to indulge, you can get pepperoni on top. It's very nice. It's very nice. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Bye, everybody. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Bye.